Hi, my name's Steve Bradbury, and along with Adam Jenke and John Tyndall, we're looking forward to sharing some ideas and some recent research that takes a look at approaches for both saving money and conserving monarch butterflies, and how to stack these environmental benefits as we proceed with our conservation efforts in non-crop lands across Iowa. What we're going to share with you today are an overview of monarch butterfly biology and the current status of the North American monarch populations and how their decline over the last decade or so has led to engagement of the Endangered Species Act in terms of approaches to try to help conserve the species. Then we're going to share some um, findings on how different kinds of habitat establishment practices can help not only save money, but also help the state of Iowa reach its monarch conservation targets. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about the monarch butterfly, its biology, its life cycle, and some of its unique um, migratory uh, aspects. So the North American monarch butterfly population represents about 90% or accounts for 90% of the monarchs worldwide. And the North American monarch is unique in the animal kingdom in that it undertakes the, these dramatic migrations and migrations that span four to five generations of monarchs. As you can see on the map, there are two subpopulations of the monarch butterfly in the United States, Mexico, Canada. One, one subpopulation migrates and resides for the most part in the western part of the United States, um, along the Pacific Ocean and up to the Rockies. The eastern population of the monarch butterfly migrates east of the Rocky Mountains. Now what's interesting about the, the monarch is that this migration from Mexico up to southern Canada and then back to Mexico spans four to five generations uh, in a year. And this is very unique. I think it's about it's the only species, insect species, that has this type of migration. So let's go through the migration cycle. So we'll pretend it's right now, down in Mexico. It's it's late January, early February, and the monarchs down in Mexico have been overwintering since about Halloween. So they were, they arrived in in Mexico right around the end of October, early December. And they're going to stay in that overwintering grounds, a forest in, in that part of Mexico, until late winter, early spring. And then that generation is going to start heading north. And they're going to become redu reproductively active as they're heading north. And they'll be laying eggs along um, the uh, Mexico-Texas border into Texas and parts of Oklahoma. Then those adults die after they mate and lay their eggs. And then their eggs uh, hatch, and then the next set of adults will migrate up to the north central states, our part, our neck of the woods in the United States, as well as over to north, the northeastern part of the United States and up to southern Canada. Now that second and third generation, which is up here in the upper Midwest, they don't migrate, so they're traversing about the Iowa landscapes in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois. They're reproductively active, they're laying eggs, and, and eventually those adults die, their offspring then fulfill, a, go through another cycle. And then when we're at the fourth generation, which is going to be the adults emerging in the uh, late summer, early fall, then they migrate back down to Mexico. And as they're migrating back down to Mexico, they're no longer reproductively active. And there's been some physiological changes so that they can fly those long distances. So four to five generations in the course of a year with that migration from Mexico up to the upper Midwest, southern Canada, and then back down to Mexico. So a very unique phenomenon in, in, our, in our whole world. So how long does the, a generation last? Well, the first stage is the egg stage, and the egg stage lasts three to five or so days. After the eggs hatch, then it's the, in, the, the larval stages, and there's five larval, larval stages for the monarch, and 
that period of time is roughly a co up to a couple of weeks. Those fifth instars are the last stage larvae, then pupate and form the chrysalis. And after about a week to two weeks, approximately, the adults emerge. And the adults will live between a couple of weeks to maybe a month. And those, those females and males will be moving around the landscapes of Iowa and the upper Midwest states, laying eggs and continuing the cycle. So that, that population that overwinters in Mexico, uh, there's been a lot of research to try to figure out where those monarchs were born the monarchs that make it all the way to Mexico. And by doing stable isotope analyses, it appears that about 50% of the overwintering monarchs um, were born, their eggs, their eggs and, and how they started their life, uh, was in Iowa and the neighboring north central states. So the north central states are really critical for the overall population health of the eastern population of the, of the North American monarchs with 50 to actually 60% of those monarchs that are in the overwintering grounds coming from Iowa and neighboring states. So in that breeding ground in the upper Midwest, including Iowa, which is sort of in the bullseye of the conservation area, milkweed is really important. Milkweed is the obligate host of, of the monarchs. So the female monarch only lays eggs on milkweed plants and larvae only consume milkweed leaves. So having milkweed in the landscape is critical to ensuring good population growth of the monarchs. If there's no milkweed, there won't be any monarchs. Now the females and the males, they don't eat the leaves, of course. They rely on nectar sources for their diet, and certainly they'll nectar on flowers of, of milkweed but they'll also nectar on other, other forbs, blooming plants in the landscape. So the adults have a bit broader um, dietary uh, resources, but for the larvae, it's milkweed and milkweed only. In Iowa, common milkweed is, just like the name suggests, common, and that's a, a really important species for the monarchs to, to, uh, for laying eggs and for larval production. But in addition, in Iowa, butterfly milkweed, swamp milkweed are examples of other milkweed species that are fairly abundant across the landscape. And as Adam will discuss in a little bit, pretty common in seed mixes used to establish monarch breeding habitat. So milkweed in the upper Midwest, along with other nectaring resources for the adults is critical to support the monarch population. So one really important question, of course, is how many monarchs are out there? How do we know what the status of the population is? And how do we track changes in the population as we put more habitat into the landscape to help with conservation efforts? Well, it's really tough to figure out how many monarchs are around Iowa and the upper Midwest by trying to get a, a census or a survey of their numbers during the breeding season up here in, in Iowa and, and neighboring states. And that's partly because habitat patches are scattered all across the landscape. So there's not one place to go to, to, to make estimates of the number of, of females or males that are out there. It's also pretty difficult to find them um, in these kinds of habitat scenarios. They're spread out all across the landscape. So what's difficult in terms of tracking monarchs up in our neck of the woods isn't the same down in Mexico. So when the monarchs are overwintering in Mexico, they're congregating in these omil fir forests in, in some mountains in, in the southern part of Mexico. And so they clump up in those trees. And in that one shot, you can see those trees and the and the brown tinge that's on some of those trees. Those aren't trees that are dying. Those are trees that are full of monarchs. And in some of the other pictures, you can see how they clump up and then occasionally fly to streams to get some water to help with their lipid metabolism. So the fact that they clump so nicely in these trees creates an opportunity 
to have at least an indirect measure of the population status. By surveying these forests and estimating how much surface area of the forest is occupied by monarchs, we can come up with an indirect indicator or metric of their population status. So tracking those forests in Mexico has been going on since the early 90s and up through today. And in fact, the data is being analyzed now to see how well the overwintering populations did this past winter. And so as you can see in the bar graph, where it's the, on the y-axis, it's the amount of hectares of, of forest canopy occupied by monarchs. And then on the x-axis, time, you can see the general decline in the monarch population. And it's had approximately an 80% decline over the last two to three decades. And so this serious drop in, in the, the population has sparked the conservation efforts that have been going on across the United States over the last five to six years. And you can see in 2012, 2013, a precipitous drop in the number of overwintering monarchs. And in fact, in those years, the numbers were so low that if there had been a severe ice storm in Mexico, it may have resulted in the loss of the, of the migratory behavior just because there wouldn't be enough monarchs to even make it up in the migration. So of course, as you can imagine, there's been a lot of research going on to try to understand the causes for that decline. Certainly extreme weather events play a, play a role in the patterns that you see. And you can see in the bar graph, there are periods when the, when the population is fairly high and then there's a significant drop and then a recovery. And many times those, those dips are associated with extreme weather, either a harsh winter in Mexico, an ice storm in Mexico, or droughts in Texas, or too much heat up here in the upper Midwest. And that causes those fluctuations. But you also see that even though those fluctuations occur, the overall numbers are dropping over time, which then um, raises concern because if a bad weather event happens too many years in a row, the numbers could really be too low. But some of the other causes that are associated with that general decline include deforestation in Mexico, so loss of overwintering habitat. However, over the last 10 to 15 years, the Mexican government has been doing a pretty outstanding job in protecting the forests. And they're patrolled, and the federal army in Mexico helps ensure that the, the forests are protected. So while still an issue and reforestation is going to be critical, at least the loss of habitat in Mexico has been curtailed. The other significant contribution to that habitat loss has to do with breeding in our part of the country, in the north central states. And the loss of milkweed and the loss of nectar sources are considered to be an important contributor to that decline. And by increasing habitat could also be a big driver to population recovery. So this chart is again a repeat, so you can see again the same pattern of, of the populations over time. But you also see that dashed line, which has the label of conservation goal. And through a lot of analyses on those trends in population responses, changes in, in habitat condition in the north central states over the last 20, 25 years, an association has been established between the amount of milkweed habitat in the north central states and the overwintering population. And through those analyses, a goal has been established to, to reach a, a situation where we've got a stable monarch population. And that conservation goal is six hectares of occupied forest. And it means six hectares of occupied forest over a prolonged period of time. So basically, we want to get to the point where the average amount of forest canopy that's occupied by the monarchs to be six hectares. So you can see a year or two ago, we had a, uh, an increase in, in the numbers, which was great, got up to six hectares. What we want to do is see those bars up around six hectares or higher over the long haul, over 10 to 20 years at a time. And so this loss of, of milkweed habitat in the upper Midwest is, is a focus on conservation efforts. And the current um, estimates to turn those numbers around to get 
up to six hectares of occupied forest involves getting 1.3 to 1.6 billion new milkweed stems into the north central landscape. Now, all the work that we need to do in the upper Midwest isn't alone going to turn the numbers around. And so in, in this map of the United States, you can see where the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has identified different monarch conservation areas where different sets of conservation practices are going to be needed to sustain the population. And if we focus on the eastern population, you can see the north central states where that 1.3 billion stems need to be established over the next 20 years. And then you can also see the southern part of the flyway through Texas, Oklahoma, into Kansas, southern Missouri. And in those areas, the milkweed population's uh, habitat is in pretty good shape. But what's really needed there is an increase in the amount of nectar plants to fuel the monarchs as they're heading back uh, through Texas into Mexico. So that Fish and Wildlife Service map um, has some connections to the Endangered Species Act. And so right now, the monarch butterfly has been uh, identified as a candidate species for listing under the Endangered Species Act. And back in 2014, when those numbers were really low, as you may recall from the bar graphs, uh, there was a petition submitted to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service re requesting that the service consider whether or not the monarch butterfly should be listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. And over the last several years, the Fish and Wildlife Service has been evaluating research ongoing uh, in universities across North America, looking at different aspects of monarch butterfly behavior, habitat requirements, the effects of pesticides on on monarchs, the relationships between habitat quality and characteristics and monarch recovery, to go through those analyses to determine whether or not the species should be listed, and if it should be listed, what are some of the conservation practices that are going to be critical to its recovery. As the Fish and Wildlife Service was pulling together that information, uh, the NRCS, uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, entered discussions with the Fish and Wildlife Service to ensure practices they were recommending for monarch conservation would be considered by the Fish and Wildlife Service and to ensure that landowners working, um, implementing Farm Bill programs under NRCS would be assured of no additional regulatory um, requirements if the species was listed. And around that time, all the states in the mid part of America got together to come up with a conservation plan that spanned all the states in the north central part of the country. Same thing was going on out west with the western population. And during that time, there was also a development of, of plans in Iowa, which I'll touch on in just a second. And right now, uh, FSA, the part of USDA that implements the Conservation Reserve Program, is in discussions with Fish and Wildlife Service to assure conservation practices they're putting forth for the monarchs are prepared in such a way that farmers doing those practices know they don't have to do any additional regulatory um, steps if the, if the species is listed. So this past December, on December 15th, is when the Fish and Wildlife Service determined that yes, the species, the monarch species, is warranted for listing as either an endangered or threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. But because they have other species at greater risk, ahead of the monarch, they won't make the final listing decision or issue the final listing decision until uh, 2024. So some time for all of us to be working on conservation of the monarch. So in fact, we can maybe get to the point where the Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't have to make a decision to list as we come up to 2024. So back in, in 2014, 2015, as those numbers were looking pretty grim down in Mexico, a lot of different partners in the state of Iowa came together and, and decided it was important for the state to take some leadership in monarch conservation. And the Iowa Monarch Conservation Consortium was formed and now has over 50 members spanning agricultural organizations and conservation groups, agribusiness, the industry, energy industry, and with help from our state and federal agencies. 
And so this group has been together now for five, six years, working towards implementation of conservation practices in the Iowa landscape to help contribute to the mo recovery of the monarch. And the conservation goals are, are broad in that they want to ensure that a diversity of stakeholders come together, working together, especially with a focus on agricultural landscapes, but also urban and suburban landscapes, to ensure that the state comes together from all its different folks with different, different roles and responsibilities and interests to work together to enhance monarch butterfly conservation in the state and contribute along with our neighboring states into the recovery of the species. Back in 2018, the consortium put together a strategy for um, getting the habitat established in the state and developed habitat targets consistent with the plan for the Mid-America or North Central states. And you can see on this table the, the breakdown of acres or stems that uh, need to be established in Iowa over the next 20 years so Iowa can reach its share of the overall goals for the North Central states. Thinking about billions of stems or hundreds of thousands of stems is at least hard for me to get my head wrapped around what that actually looks like. So what, we, what the consortium did was work to translate thousands of stems or hundreds of thousands of stems to acres with various assumptions about seeding rates and seed germination and maintenance practices. So on the left-hand side of the, of the table, you get a sense of the different uh, sectors, if you will, in the state and the range of goals of numbers of habitat to get established in the state to reach our conservation goals. And you can see that acres in the agricultural landscape are gonna be really important, a real driver to the overall effort but it really is an all hands on deck. Everybody from cities to agricultural landscapes and communities all have a role to play in helping with conservation. So this table breaks, breaks out the agricultural um, landscape into different land cover, land use categories. And as you can see in that table and think about um, what that landscape looks like for those from for poultry farms or CRP land or pastures, you kind of in your mind can kind of imagine what some of those opportunities are for establishing habitat. And certainly some aspects of, of conservation and CRP involves converting soybeans or corn into CRP, and maybe it's CP42, a pollinator habitat mix, which will help bees as well as, as monarchs. But there's not going to be a lot more of those kinds of acres available. And so as you take a look at those categories, a big effort is going to involve converting grass-dominated sites into monarch habitat. And that requires a slightly different set of practices for habitat establishment than what we do when we're going into corn or soybeans that have been in, in production for a number of years. And Adam's now going to spend some time describing what some of those practices are to convert grass-dominated sites into monarch habitat. And as we were doing this research, we not only refined the conservation practices, but working with John Tyndall, we also came to understand that converting some of these grass-dominated sites not only conserves monarchs, but it can also save you money. And Adam's going to walk through those habitat practices, and the financial analyses that we did. Hi, my name is Adam Janke. I'm the Extension Wildlife Specialist here at Iowa State and Extension. And I'm going to build on the things that Steve just talked about, only now we're going to talk about how we put monarch butterfly habitat out on out on our farms. Steve did a nice job of setting up the challenge that's in front of us and the opportunities that we see for monarch butterfly habitat. And now I'm going to talk about some of the nuts and bolts and what we're learning about where and how we can establish monarch butterfly habitat and maybe what it means for the financial picture on our farms. And so first, I want to just get us all on the same page with the goal or the task at hand. And that's here simply stated as these three uh, goals or three components of our goals. We need to have season long nectar resources on our landscape, on our farms from May to October. And that means we need to have flowering plants that the monarchs and other pollinators can find 
and take advantage of for the primary food source for the adult monarchs and a wide diversity of pollinators, of course. Then, as Steve introduced, the life cycle of the monarch is tied closely to milkweeds. And so on all of our farms, we also need to have an abundance of milkweeds. The milkweeds, of course, are the nursery plants where adult monarchs lay their eggs and then the young transition through those various caterpillar instar stages in, before emerging as an adult that feeds on nectar. So we need both floral resources or nectar resources and milkweeds and we need them on every single farm in Iowa. And that's how we're going to restore the monarch butterfly population. And, of course, have beautiful, aesthetically beautiful landscapes like the one pictured here uh, from a Boone County farm. So one thing I wanted to point out is one resource available from the Extension store is a monarch seed mix. There's lots of resources out there for creating a seed mix or purchasing a seed mix commercially. But one thing I wanted to point out is illustrated nicely on this PDF here is how there are blooms shown in the colors of the flowers here in this table available throughout the the growing season or throughout the breeding season of the monarch butterfly in Iowa. And that's really important that we think about more than just milkweeds. And we have to remember that flowering plants are really important and finding ways to put those flowering plants back into our working landscapes is the focus of a lot of our education and research work here at Iowa State. So where are we going to put pollinator habitat back on our farm? Steve introduced that table with a lot of opportunity areas. And he mentioned that we see a lot of potential of diversifying, providing more flowering plants in areas that are currently grass dominated. That's depicted here with three of these frames. And then another important opportunity area is areas within our row crop production systems that are today perhaps unprofitable. So here I could plug, there's a couple other talks in the Crops TV series that I've been involved with. One uh, called Redefining the Field Edge, where we talk specifically about taking marginal areas and crop fields, unprofitable areas and crop fields out of production and putting them into native perennial vegetation, and also a general talk on wildlife habitat. And you can uh, find both of those in the archives and uh, learn more details about row crop areas. What we're going to talk about for the rest of today's presentation is focusing mostly on these grass-dominated sites. Three different types of grass-dominated sites in Iowa. One is what we call uh, native warm season grasses. So these are native uh, grass species, bunch grass species that are often planted, for example, through the Conservation Reserve Program. And sometimes when those sites go unmanaged for a long time or depending on their initial planting conditions, they can get dominated by a, um, a homogenous stands of just a few species of grass and not have very many flowering plants or milkweeds in them. Uh, Non-native cool season grasses are really common on roadsides, in pastures or abandoned pastures, and in some CRP fields as well. These are things like smooth brome, reed canary grass, Kentucky bluegrass, uh, and like the warm season grass stands, they can become a monoculture or, or uh, have very few flowering plants in them. And then the other one, the enemy of all wildlife biologists, is the idle area, the mowed areas that we have just nothing, no better ideas of what to do with them. And so we just mow them every year. And we see these as a real opportunity for introducing pollinator habitat back into our working landscapes. And I'm going to present an economic analysis that makes a pretty strong case for uh, doing that both financially and aesthetically and just because it's good for the environment. Uh, so it's just kind of the good thing or the right thing to do. So we're going to talk about all those as we go. There's a couple of uh, generalizable rules that we can talk about in any time that we look to establish new pollinator habitat on a site. And that's these four steps are going to be involved. We have to prepare the site and we have to understand the site conditions. We'll spend some time talking about that. We have to purchase our seed and then put the seed in the ground. We'll talk about that. We have to take care to get those seeds established. These are perennial plants that require uh, time to establish root systems and to advance through their life history. And uh, it's different than what we see in many uh, particularly agricultural crops. So there's some different approaches and we're going to talk about that taking time and monitoring. And then of course we have to manage so as to not lose the diversity that we've introduced there. And we'll talk a little bit about those management practices as well. 
So the first thing is site preparation. And site preparation, as we'll discuss on a few slides, is the most important step, particularly when converting a grass-dominated stand, turf grass, cool season grass, or native warm season grasses, into a more diverse stand that's better for pollinators. It's really important that we take time to get control over the extant vegetation on the site so that we give our native plants the best chance uh, to be successfully established. And so some things that we wanna do in site preparation for a pollinator planting. We wanna minimize soil disturbances to the site, but we wanna try to open up bare ground or bare soil on the site so that we can ensure good seed to soil contact when we go back to plant it. Um, that can be through things like baling, mowing and baling in the growing season before the planting, uh, or it could even be a really light disking or preparation with something like a cultipacker uh, to try to find areas where there's bare soil, but not totally disk up the site. We also importantly need to eradicate the existing vegetation, and that is especially true for those monocultures of grasses in those grass-dominated sites. And we normally want to do that with herbicide applications. And what we say is multiple herb herbicide applications in the year before the planting to try to get control over uh, and kill out the grasses or the uh, weed pressure that's at the site. And so uh, that's the last point is to understand that potential weed pressure. If this is a weedy area in a pasture, or maybe it's even been a low lying area in a crop field that just consistently fails and has a lot of weed pressure, that might create a real challenge for the um, habitat establishment or the pollinator habitat or the native seed establishment once we put the seed in the ground. And remember, as soon as we put that seed in the ground, we lose a lot of the tools that would have been otherwise in our tool belt. For example, because we're planting a diversity of grasses, sedges, and flowering plants, we can't really use any herbicides um, on a large scale on a site once the native seed is on the ground. And so we want to potentially use our herbicide to control the vegetation beforehand, deplete the weed pressure and uh, kill off the sod forming grasses or the uh, dense native grasses uh, before we put the seed on the ground and have to go into more sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat with spot treatments and otherwise. So here below is a picture of a two-year-old planting. This is still very young in pollinator planting age, um, but the picture on the left, it was in a corn and soybean uh, Field. So that would be a site that we have good weed control. We had good bare ground to plant into. Um, there wasn't any sod forming grasses to kill or anything like that. And the site on the right is two years after trying to establish pollinator habitat in non-native cool season grasses, where you can see there just wasn't very good control and uh, the pollinator plants, the diverse flowering plants that we put on the ground there were not as successful in coming back. So a site like this needed some help. Uh, it could have been three to four herbicide applications in the growing season prior to the winter planting. Or in some of these sites, we even recommend taking them uh, out of the perennial vegetation and putting them into row crops for one or two years and then planting prairie following soybeans. One year, uh, one last year of soybeans uh, creates a nice seed bed and then you can plant your prairie into that. So there's lots of uh, technical considerations to make here and this site preparation step that we'll uh, talk about a little bit more in the talk is really an important one to consider. Once you've uh, done your site preparation, it's time to plant. And what we say of prairie is that we plant it the way mother nature intends and that is uh, to drop the seeds on the soil during the winter time for the most part. So imagine a prairie plant or a, a prairie ecosystem where the seeds grow up through the summer and through the growing season and then they form a seed head and then gradually during the winter time they blow off the seed head or they're dispersed by animals or insects or others and they settle on top of the so snow or on top of the frozen soil and gradually through a freeze thaw cycle work their way into the ground. Uh, we say that's how mother nature plants them and so that's what we generally recommend is a non-growing season or dormant season planting into uh, uh, shallow snow or on top of frozen ground 
uh, either with a drill, like a specialized drill, like is pictured here, or even with a broadcast seeder uh, that some people have had success with. This specialized drill here is often available through county conservation boards or local Pheasants Forever chapters that you could reach out to, uh, or NRCS or Soil and Water Conservation Districts, you could reach out to and try to find out if they have this specialized uh, native grass and wildflower drill. These are uh, created to ensure that the seed is not planted too deep into the ground and that it can also handle the fluffy light seeds that some prairie plants have and the heavier, more stout seeds that other prairie plants have. So there's different boxes on this drill um, and, and they get fed in uh, slightly differently to ensure um, successful planting in a relatively homogenous stand uh, of the native seeds. And so uh, again, you could find local help with Iowa DNR, Soil and Water Conservation Districts, NRCS, Pheasants Forever, and others, uh, and find access to one of these drills. Or, like I said, you can do uh, dormant season broadcasting. The next step in the process of establishing pollinator habitat on a site is to take care to allow the seedlings to establish. In, in this scenario, what we often recommend is that you try to help the perennial native perennials that you put into the pollinator mix by um, managing the annual plants that will grow up on the site in the first couple of years through mowing. And so a lot of research at the University of Northern Iowa's Tallgrass Prairie Center has uh, clearly demonstrated the importance of mowing early on in the establishment of prairie and pollinator plantings. And this isn't like mowing like a yard. What we say is this is mowing three to four times a year, around six to eight inches above the ground. You're not trying to hit the establishing seedlings of the native uh, perennial plants, but you're trying to out, take off the biomass of the annual plants that are growing above those small seedlings. And so here's what that looks like from some slides from the Tallgrass Prairie Center. And on the right, you can see the really robust, robust growth of the native prairie plants in the mowed plot and the uh, really weak growth of the native prairie plants in the unmowed plot because they're just not getting as much sunlight through competition with the annual plants. What we say of native perennial plants of all types, trees and uh, prairie plants and grasses, is that they grow down in their first year and annual plants grow up. And so annual plants, because they're only growing for one life, one year, will just invest all their energy to above ground biomass. And uh, in that way can really quickly outcompete a perennial plant that's playing the long game in trying to establish a root system below the ground to try to ensure its long-term survival through periods of drought and flood and others. So we wanna help these perennial plants get established by trying to minimize that above ground competition through occasional mowing in the first year and also occasional mowing and spot treatment in subsequent years. And so here again is just another plot from picture from the Tallgrass Prairie Center of a few years later. Uh, and you can see that the plot on the left that was mowed during the first year establishment uh, is doing much better than the plot on the right that where the annual weeds kind of prevailed and maybe outcompeted the establishment of the perennial plants. The final step, the fourth and final step, is maintenance. These areas, although they certainly require less maintenance than many other areas on our farms, like turf grass areas, uh, they do require occasional disturbances. These tall grass prairie ecosystems uh, that pollinator plots mimic were, of course, regularly grazed, and many plants are adapted to grazing and also adapted to fire. And so uh, active management of these plots through, for example, occasional prescribed fire once every four years or so can be really important in maintaining the diversity of all the flowering plants that you put into your seed mix uh, at the start. And so we encourage people to figure out a way to use prescribed fire, work with local rural fire departments, or again, collaborate with county conservation boards or Iowa Department of Natural Resources to get this occasional disturbance into your pollinator habitat uh, and uh, to ensure that it maintains diversity. If you put your pollinator habitat around a building or other places where you don't feel comfortable or it's not safe to use prescribed fire, other sources of disturbance like occasional uh, mowing and baling or um, uh, grazing could also be effective and even light disking can be an effective strategy.
The Monarch Conservation Consortium that Steve introduced and we'll talk some more about to wrap up the talk has done a lot of work around the state just sort of evaluating these types of practices in um, establishing demonstration or pollinator habitat patches around the state. And that's what's pictured there on that map on the right. And you can see on the figure on the left that they've had variable success in establishment. This stuff is not a recipe and for sure to yield a successful picture. There's a lot of, uh, of limitations that or challenges that are presented by different sites and uh, different growing conditions and seeding conditions and other things. So uh, this isn't a sure bet to be successful in establishing pollinator habitat every year. But if you follow those four steps that we mentioned, we think it's going to increase your probability of success. And the experience of the Monarch Conservation Consortium team here at Iowa State has been that the sites that are most inclined to fail and that they just don't have a diversity of native flowering plants after a few years of monitoring are mostly related to unsuccessful early site preparation, like those really important steps of creating bare ground for seed to soil contact, controlling weed pressure, and controlling uh, dense stands of the grasses that are already on the site. So we want to just emphasize that one more time and say that uh, learn from these, these failures and uh, make sure to follow those steps very carefully as you apply this stuff onto your own farm. So this is just one last slide uh, to just sort of reiterate this. I'm not going to spend any more time on uh, these site preparation steps, uh, but know that there's some guidance out there from NRCS and other places, and you can find that on the Monarch uh, Conservation Consortium website and also our Natural Resources Extension uh, website. So the last thing that we wanted to talk about is making sort of an economic case for pollinator habitat. We get a lot of questions about, well, how much does it cost? And what are the upfront costs versus the long-term costs of pollinator habitat? And we're trying to um, understand this. And so we collaborated, uh, Steve and I and John Tyndall, an economist here at Iowa State, collaborated to try to pencil out what the costs of pollinator est habitat establishment and management is and compare it to what we, one of the primary targets uh, of our education efforts, turf grass, as an alternative management strategy. So we wanted to directly compare annual expenses in pollinator habitat versus turf grass uh, areas on our farms. And so this slide here shows you our thinking in how much pollinator habitat cost per acre. And you can see the steps that I just talked about, the four steps that I just talked about in establishment and management of pollinator habitat are shown here and accounted for for their various expenses. And this is extrapolated over a 10-year period. We're imagining you would establish pollinator habitat in an area, for example, that today is a yard, um, a, like a y large turf grass area uh, on a farm um, or around an agricultural building in a rural landscape. And uh, manage it for 10 years in that way. And so early on, there's going to be more expenses for sure. We've got to get control over the existing vegetation and weed pressure and all the other steps associated with site preparation. We have to buy the native seed. And if you've ever done this, you'll find it is rather expensive on a per acre basis. It can range from uh, over $100 for a low diversity mix to over $500 for a high diversity mix. We pick something right in the middle at $321 uh, per acre. Uh, the planting costs, you could conceivably contract those out and we esti the estimates are there. Mowing in the first year, burning in subsequent years as a management strategy, and also occasional spot weed treatments to deal with problematic plants like Canada thistle or whatever may occasionally pop up in these plots. So we estimate over a 10-year period in doing some sort of fancy economics corrections for what economists call net present value, uh, Dr. Tyndall estimated that it would cost $994 in present value to establish one acre of pollinator habitat and manage it as such over a 10-year period. And if you average that out over um, a per acre per year basis, it's $111 per acre per year uh, to establish pollinator habitat, with again, many of these expenses coming up front with the establishment and purchase of the seed. 
To contrast that, we did the exact same approach with turf grass, just imagining that the turf grass, like the picture of this um, rural farmstead here on the right, uh, imagining that it's already established and that what we need to do is just annually mow it, which we estimated uh, occurs around 25 times a year. We need to annually apply a fertilizer and control weeds. It's just sort of a typical management following extension guidelines and others on managing turf grass. And we estimate that over a 10 year period, this would cost just over $6,000 or $678 per acre per year. And so you can see toggling between these two, that pollinator habitat, although there are a lot of upfront costs associated with purchasing the seed and site preparation and establishment, uh, is appreciably less expensive than managing extant stands of turf grass on farms. And so we hope that people will perhaps consider this as one more compelling reason to diversify our landscapes and our non-farm acres in uh, rural areas to try to help the monarch butterfly, try to help native bees and a whole diversity of other pollinating insects and uh, other species of wildlife that benefit from these environments. And while you're at it, save a few dollars. So there's a couple of neat examples of this going on by the Monarch team and others around the state. Here's an example of a collaboration with a swine production facility uh, in central Iowa where they had an idle area that they were paying someone to annually mow, probably at $700 an acre a year based on our economic analysis. And they converted it into this uh, pollinator stand on the right and of course saved money and also helped the monarchs. And there's a really neat video all about that available at the Monarch Conservation Consortium website. So that's all my slides for today. What I'm gonna do now is transition back to Steve and he's gonna wrap it up in thinking about how we can put these things together to do right by the monarchs and also uh, put some more pollinator habitat back out on our working landscapes. So thanks. Thanks, Adam. That was a great summary of the, of the habitat establishment practices and the maintenance practices and the very important point of that, that uh, pre-planting preparation. Sometimes it may even take an extra year before you plant, but the time and care spent in depleting that weed seed bank and killing the grass can save a lot of time going forward and increase your likelihood of success in establishing your habitat. As Adam mentioned, we did a number of habitat establishment efforts across the state, and the information from these exercises, these efforts, really did um, highlight the importance of that preparation step. So if we prepare these sites properly, we have a very good chance of a, having a successful habitat patch established. And as you can see in the sites across the state, we looked at a number of different locations in the state with different kinds of conditions and different settings. And all the results of these sites suggested the importance of, of site preparation. And so there's opportunities near buildings like swine confinement areas, field borders, and also some opportunities to link this effort up with our nutrient reduction strategy techniques. So establishing habitat on top of saturated buffers or bioreactors or artificial wetlands also provides us an opportunity to get a lot of bang for the buck in terms of environmental benefits, as well as saving a few bucks by converting grass-dominated sites to habitat. So again, just seeing some of the contrasts over a two to three year effort with that site preparation creates a nice diverse um, habitat patch. And these habitat patches aren't not only beneficial to monarchs and our research established increased monarch utilization in these sites, but we also tracked native bees and honeybees using these sites. And you definitely get a lot of biodiversity and other pollinators in these sites. So we're getting not only monarch benefits, but we're getting other pollinator benefits and saving a few bucks. And also seeing a lot of bird activity in these sites as well. And so finding pheasants and um, other nesting birds that are nesting in these habitat patches. So one of the take home messages we want to get across is that while establishing this habitat is very important for monarch conservation, and we talked about some of the challenges right now in restoring the monarch population, but implementing these practices is also beneficial more broadly 
the biodiversity that's added to the landscape supports other pollinators, other beneficial insects, and, and uh, uh, birds in the area as well, as well as saving some bucks. So on our website and in the Extension Store, you can see, you can get copies of our reports describing these, these efforts of establishing habitat in grass-dominated sites, establishing habitat over saturated buffers and near hog confinement facilities. And so these documents provide some more detailed information as well as links to other resources to help in your planning. Now, as Adam mentioned, on the natural resource websites and the monarch websites, we have links to resources within your county where there may be Pheasants Forever or NRCS or U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service folks that are ready to help, as well as some broader information that's available on our sites and uh, the means to contact Adam or myself to provide any advice. So thanks, everyone, for watching our video, and good luck in establishing your monarch habitat.